to come in for the fall festival and help out with it. And it's been a tremendous blessing, but that means long nighttime conversations that tend to spill over into the next day. And so we'll do the best we can, but bear with me if you will. We'll look at 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to focus primarily on verses 8 and 9. The letter of 1 Peter opens with an overview of some glorious facts concerning our salvation. In this first chapter, verses 6 through 9 specifically, talk about the joy of salvation. And as we think about the joy of this salvation, the joy of our salvation, the writer Peter wants us to know that this joy of salvation is something that can be ours even during trials. Importantly, the specific trials he has in mind are the ones that distress us the ones that pull us down, the ones that weigh heavily upon us. He's thinking of those trials that bring such distress and distraught to the lives of many. And yet, in those times, he wants us to know that we can have the joy of our salvation. So the question is, does Peter really mean to say that we can be glad in times that trials are heavily upon us and they are making us feel sorrowful and even unhappy just with the things of life? Yes. In fact, he would say, if I could put you in a moment in time in your life in which you have felt that way, the words I would have to share with you are these words. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 8. And though you have not seen Him, speaking of Christ, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of of your souls. Peter says the trials or temptations that we face of this nature produce a twofold fruit. One, they increase our faith in God, verse 7. Two, they increase our love for God, verses 8 and 9. You see, the Christian's joy is grounded in the fact that God has given him new life, a living hope, a certainty of receiving God's rich blessings, and of possession of salvation now, but the completion of that salvation at the end of time. So the question for you and I to consider is, is Christianity a burden or a bridge. Look again at 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9. And though you have not seen Him, that's a burden. We have not physically seen Christ. We long to see Him. And so at times it feels as though life is a burden. It's just the path that we have to follow to get to the next step where we want to be with the Lord. He says, but you love Him. That's the bridge. What's going to motivate us to walk this earthly walk? What is going to motivate us to continue in the Christian faith? What's going to motivate us to keep looking forward to the time in which we can be with the Lord? Our love for Him. And though you do not see Him now, again, that's a burden. We want to be with the Lord. Some have readily said, I'm ready to go. When it's my time, I'm ready. And if He calls me now... To God be the glory for it. Peter would say, but you believe in Him. And that's the bridge between now and the time that it is yours to go. Right now, you need to be focused on your belief in Him and your love in Him. And because of your love and because of your belief in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible. Inexpressible. 
Christian joy cannot be expressed in mere words. It's one of those, if you were able to look up Christian joy in a dictionary, it would be one of those definitions where you get to the word and it gives you the word. The very word you looked up. It says, consider joy. And that's exactly what it is. It's joy. But how do you express, how do you describe, how do you explain Christian joy? Well, it's joy. That's what it is. There's some difference in nuances between worldly happiness and Christian joy that will help us to wrestle with this idea. But Peter's simply saying Christianity is a joy. It's a joy. It's a reason for gladness. Therefore, it's a bridge to help us get to where we want to be with the Lord. So what are those differences? There are differences between worldly happiness and Christian joy because the world is seeking happiness. It depends on outward circumstances for happiness and especially on a change of these outward circumstances. People of the world are what we might label as wishy-washy. They're happy one minute, not the next. And if you were to ask them why, they really don't have a reason why. It's just the way I feel. It's the way I am. When certain things, we as Christians are really no different. What do I mean by that? As best I can determine it, Benjamin Disraeli is the one who wrote these words. As a rule, a man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. When it's cool, he wants it hot. And he always wants what's not. That's us to a T. We always want the thing we don't have until we get it, and then all of a sudden we don't want that anymore and we want something else. How often then are we discontent? And if we be discontent, how much more is the world in discontent? If we're on vacation, we want to be at home. If we're at home, we want to go on vacation. If we're young, we want to be older. If we're older, we want to be younger. And the list goes on and on. There's always something else we're wanting, something else we think will make us happy or happier. Well, happiness is like prosperity. It always seems to be just around the corner from us, always out in front of us, just out of our reach, elusively out there somewhere. But even if worldly happiness is realized, if it is obtained, it can be only temporary at best. And so we're on to pursue the next thing. George Cooper penned words that would later be put to music by Ira Sankey in the song, While the Days Are Going By. One of the lines in that song says, Oh, the world is full of sighs full of sad and weeping eyes. These words describe many of the people that we cross paths with each day. They are constantly sighing over situations, over circumstances, over what's happening at the moment, constantly sighing. But then it progresses even further. They're full of sadness, and that's why they sigh so much. But being full of sadness, they will even get to the point where their eyes are just weeping. Christian joy is different. Christian joy is inward. It's not dependent on outward circumstances. Christian joy is real and present. It's something that does not depend solely upon the future. It's within our grasp now, in this very moment, that we can have joy, the joy of salvation. And knowing the joy, no matter what the circumstances, we can still have the joy. And the best part of the Christian joy, compared to worldly happiness, is that Christian joy is eternal. It lasts all of this life and throughout eternity as well. We are assured of a joyful future knowing that we are right with the Lord. 
And so the Bible contains many instances of Christians' joy. Many of them are instances of rejoicing about matters of conversions or faithfulness of Christians. The apostles rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Acts chapter 5 verse 41. In the midst of suffering for the name of Christ, they were able to have joy and rejoice. Paul and Silas rejoiced while they were in prison, singing those hymns to God, even though their backs were bleeding from the very fresh beating that they received. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, Paul wrote, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul was chosen to reveal God's mystery plan to the Gentiles. And he revealed that Christ lives in you and that that fact is the assurance that you share in His glory. And that when He returns in glory, you will share in that glory. Colossians chapter 1 verses 25 through 27. When we consider worldly happiness, we find that it is hard to find. It's even harder to get than it is to find. And it's even harder still to keep. And so the world seems as though they're always sighing with sad and weeping eyes. But the Christian's joy is found not in self, but in Christ who is in you, Colossians 1 verse 27. It is a joy that is obtained when His Word, Christ's Word, God's Word, abides in you so that you believe Him, John 5 verse 38. And it's kept by simply keeping His Word, John chapter 15. And if you look there at John chapter 15... Beginning there in verse number 4, Jesus makes a declaration that He fleshes out for us that is very pertinent to our study tonight. The declaration Jesus makes there in John 15 in verse number 4 is that abide in Me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in Me. In other words, to bear the fruit of the joy of one's salvation, one must abide in Jesus. Three verses later in, first, in John chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. In those times of trials when we turn to God and we all of a sudden decide that we really need Him, if we've been abiding in Him and His Word's been abiding in us, then we will receive that which we need. Then in John 15, verse number 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So it's not even really our joy, or at least not our joy alone. It's Christ's joy, and Christ's joy is inserted into us by His very words. And as long as His words abide in us, He abides in us, and Him abiding in us, we have His joy. What greater joy is there? Do you know what the very next paragraph in John chapter 15 is about? John chapter 15 Beginning in verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. What's the topic? Suffering. Suffering. You see... Any time that there is great suffering, great joy comes before or after. But the joy that Peter is speaking of is a joy that's before and after, but also in the middle. 
And that's what he wants to us to arrive at. The joy of our salvation. That it never leaves us. It's always with us. So that we don't have to go around with a sad countenance. That we can go around and be happy people and enjoy one another's company. And encourage one another. But encourage those who don't even understand the joy of one's salvation. So there is a difference between worldly happiness and Christian joy. Christian joy comes after obedience to Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch rejoiced after he had been obedient. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse number 39, when they, speaking of Philip and the eunuch, came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Did Philip go on his way rejoicing? You better believe he did. Another soul was saved. Another soul was added to the Lord's body. But the eunuch, the one who was saved, by his obedience, brought rejoicing into his life. We see it again with the Philippian jailer who rejoiced only after he had been obedient to the gospel. There in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 34, the Bible reads that he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly. Rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Having believed in God is a synecdoche. It's a figure of speech that puts a part for the whole, or a part that represents the whole. If you back up one verse, Acts 16 verse 33 tells us what his belief in God caused him to do. He took them, the two prisoners, Paul and Silas, that very hour of the night, and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. Then verse 34 continues the list of what the Philippian jailer did because he believed in God. And he brought them into his house and set, the, set food before them and rejoiced greatly. Faith produces misery of a tender conscience which begs, what must I do? If my circumstances are overwhelming me, what must I do? And until we arrive at the answer to what we must do and then fulfill it, we will feel as though we are in misery. Repentance, then, is described as a soul in violent pain, dying to sin, while in painful effort being born anew. It's hard to give up things that we enjoy doing. It's hard to give up things that are not godly. It's with great pain that we die to ourselves and that we die to sin. But at the same time, through repentance, we are painfully being born again to a new hope, a new and living hope. But it's only through that divine assurance that our sins are forgiven that we can have true joy brought into our lives. Paul reported to the council that was called by the Jerusalem church there in Acts chapter 15. and He began to tell about his missionary journey and the details that were describing the conversions of the Gentiles. And by his report, he was bringing great joy to all the brethren. They were bringing great joy because the people who were there, the Christians, understood what it meant for a person to come to Christ, a person to receive Christ into themselves so that they had this joy of salvation. And as a result, they recalled the instance in which they too received this joy. And then to see others be able to enjoy the same joy, they rejoiced greatly. Romans chapter 14, verse number 17, talks about the kingdom of God, as we spoke of this morning, being righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You remember Acts chapter 2, verse 38? 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit, the one you received at baptism, is the one who brings righteousness, peace, and joy into your life. It was Paul's prayer that God would fill the church at Rome with joy, peace, and hope. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 13. Because of the obedience of the Christians in Thessalonica, Paul asked the question in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 19. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? In other words, what would make us joyful? Paul's asking that of the Christians at Thessalonica. What would make us joyful? What would make us joyful is seeing you at the judgment exalted because of your obedience to Christ. So he says it in verse 20, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, For you are our glory and joy. But as is always the case, Christ is the greatest example. The Hebrew writer wrote these words in chapter 12, verse 2. The joy set before Him, the joy set before Christ, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before Him, Christ was obedient. And His obedience brought Him great joy. Joy that he is able then to share with all. One of his apostles, John, in 3 John verse 4, mentioned, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. It's a great joy as a preacher, as a minister of the gospel to visit with old friends and acquaintances and to find out that they are still walking in the truth. It's of great encouragement to one another to know that Christians are staying faithful throughout the week and throughout the years. In fact, it brings great rejoicing when there's an occasion to catch up with one another. But that raises the question of who does rejoice? Who rejoices when one chooses the right path? Who rejoices when one receives the joy of salvation? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Even the angels join in in the heavenly host to rejoice when one soul is saved. Luke chapter 15 and verse number 7. Jesus tells us just as there is rejoicing over one lost sheep being found there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The 10th verse of the same book, Luke, same chapter, 15, says, In the same way as a woman rejoices over finding her lost coin, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. All the heavenly hosts join in. This is a lot of excitement when one dedicates their life to Christ or one is restored in their relationship with Christ. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 6, the Holy Spirit gives Christians the power to suffer with joy. As you face suffering, you can do it with joy. Who else rejoices? The church. The church rejoices. Christians give hugs and encouraging words to one another. They rejoice with those who rejoice. It's a perpetual cycle, if you will, that if there is one receiving the joy of salvation, those who have already received it rejoice with them, and the rejoicing just fuels the passion and the desire to share that message with others so that they can come to understand what is needed for them to enjoy the joy of salvation. And as soon as they respond, 
Then it's on to the next person. It's on with the gospel message. Onward and upward. The loved ones of such as family and friends of the new Christian usually rejoice. Now, there are those cases and instances where the parents of one who has decided to become a Christian are against against it or against their decision making. But by and large, family and friends support one who wants to give their life to Christ and so they rejoice. And then there is that person who is saved, just as the Ethiopian eunuch. They go on their way rejoicing because it's the joy of having salvation, knowing where you stand with God, knowing what you will have as a reward in the last day. You see, the hope of eternal life supports Christians in every trial of faith. Whereas Christians have that inward, real, present, and eternal joy that's not based on outward circumstances, monetary wants, or momentary wants, and temporary fulfillment, the Christian's joy is ever-present. It goes with you everywhere you go. It will face the trials together. And it will overcome the trials. And as you overcome the trials, there will be even greater rejoicing. You see, Christian joy brings rejoicing to everyone. The person who is rejoicing, the person they share their story of rejoicing with. And as they hear it, they'll share it with others. It's the news that you can't stop. It's the news that keeps on giving. And so Peter wants you to know and understand that although you have not seen Him, seen Jesus Christ yet, you do love Him. And your love for Him is going to carry you through. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice. How great is that rejoicing? It is so great that the joy is inexpressible. It can't be explained in words. And it's full of glory. It's literally glorified. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The love that we have for Jesus Christ and the belief that we have in Him assures us that we will see Him. But for now, we greatly rejoice with the joy of our salvation. But do you have the joy? Do you have the joy of knowing that you are saved with a salvation that will be made complete at the Lord's second coming? That's the requirement. To have the joy of salvation, you must know that you are saved and that your salvation is one that will be made complete at the Lord's second coming, whereby you get all the benefits and all the blessings that God has in store for His people for all of eternity. Do you have it? Do you have that joy? Then it ought to show on your face. It ought to show on your... Facebook postings, it ought to show on everything you have a hand in. If you do not have that hope, you do not have that joy of salvation, listen to the message of Jesus. Believe it when He says He's the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the one sent to deliver you from these difficulties of life and falling victim to Satan's temptations and giving in to sin, then make the decision. Make the decision that Jesus Christ will be your Lord, your Savior, the one who delivers you. Having made that decision, confess it, make it known, acknowledge it, state it, and then be baptized. Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will bring the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit into your life. So that you can have the joy 
of your salvation. Maybe you've already dedicated your life to Christ, but things have come between you and Him, and as a result, you've lost the joy of your salvation. It can be restored when you come to Him and allow Him to abide in you by allowing His Word to abide in you. You can have the joy. I've got the joy, joy, joy deep down in my heart. Do you have that joy? The joy of your salvation? If not, why not make that decision tonight to follow Christ, to be restored if that's the need, as together we stand and as we sing.